All right, good evening. Thank you for, uh, for joining me again. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and for those who have been following me, they will know that I have been focused around autoimmunity uh, since early 2020 and the COVID pandemic. So everything I look at, especially in terms of adverse events and complications, either from infection or the elephant in the room, tend to be focused on autoimmunity. It's very important because the reality is that we can't cure autoimmunity. We can only manage it. And if we don't manage it well, it tends to create lots of complications. So I've always considered that the scientific community not having a good grasp of autoimmunity was always a risk. So this is about a really important piece of information that I came across recently. And it was done by Outside Allen, and this is his work looking at different conditions around um, what's happening in terms of mortality. Now, in the UK, I'll just zoom in on it. I'd, I'd shown this before. In the UK, this data is, this is the last bit of it because they've changed the way that they measure it. But he was looking at specific conditions, heart failure here, cirrhosis and other liver diseases. This is what caught my attention, ischemic heart disease. He went down all the conditions and then it was looking at, in black, it means over 15% excess. Uh, dark red is, is um, over 10%. Light red is over 5%. Um, and yellow is just, or orange is just below, just above 0%. So what had caught my attention was this here. This was in 2022, because you can see all the years running down here. So this is the year, 2021, 2022. And you can see here in black, the quality of the image is not so good. But you can see the principle that in 2022, we had a significant rise, has come down a bit, but it still remains high. That caught my attention because I realized that in the context of the pandemic, looking out for unusual patterns is really important. You don't ignore unusual patterns. That's one important letter, lesson that I've learned. And so because of that, it has called me to put together another one of my webinars. And so this is in a couple of days. So it's on Thursday, the 29th of uh, February at 7 p.m. Um, there are tickets available. Usually we give a proportion of tickets that are free. The rest are donation. Oh, sorry, but all the free tickets have been snapped up, but we still have donation tickets available and it is any donation, small or large, just to support the work. It does take quite a bit of time to put together these presentations and the research going into it, even though I enjoy it, is quite an investment of time. So your support is very much appreciated. So what I'll be talking about today is giving a kind of idea as to where I'm heading with regards to this and the elephant in the room. And what I'll be focused on is this particular paper. And this paper was published in 2022. You can see it here if you can see the writing. So new onset and relapse liver diseases following COVID-19 vaccination, a systemic um, review systematic review, sorry. And so 2022, I usually look at the authors and the authors here are actually from Saudi Arabia. So this is from the Middle East. Um, and essentially what I found interesting is right at the start of it here, they said something in the abstract. They started off liver diseases post-COVID vaccination are extremely rare but can occur. It, the truth is, is that it seems as though if you don't put that statement right at the top, you will not get the paper published. I don't know why anybody would say that because we don't know. Um, all we, all they were doing was looking at published papers, but published papers does not necessarily reflect the real life reality of what is happening on the ground. And so within that framework, uh, there are a couple of things about it that I think are quite important. Uh, so they did find that there are a number of conditions and out of the, uh, the articles that they found, you can see here again. So they looked at uh, a number of um, papers that were published and they found 275 cases 
from 118 articles. That's what they used in their um, systematic review and they put that together and it was looking at all the causes that occurred around it. Now, the reason that I'm focused on this is because I think it's underestimated. People are going about their lives as if everything is normal. And I think that is a little bit dangerous in the context of what has happened across the world. When I do the presentation, there are three things I'm going to be focused on. And I think that all three of them are relevant. We underestimate that for many people who drink alcohol, there is some degree of liver damage. Now, you have to remember that the, the liver can take quite a lot of hits, including lots of alcohol. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not being damaged. You only start to notice the effects when about less than 20% of the liver is left. So oftentimes people can think their liver function tests are normal, so therefore they are fine. Not necessarily. It's far more complex than that. The other um, beast in the room is the fatty liver. This fatty liver is something that is growing for, um, across the, the world in terms of numbers. I think that when I looked at it, for people who are overweight or obese, you're talking about almost 50 to 85% of them have a fatty liver. Now, not all forms of fatty liver are necessarily going to cause liver problems, but that's what we'll discuss as well. And then critically, we talk about the elephant in the room. It's interesting that even though you have um, issues around infection, it tended to affect primarily the lungs, the heart, and the kidneys. We used to see some cases where there are elevated liver enzymes around a severe COVID infection. Um, and even the ferritin, I remember thinking this was an indication of liver damage, but in reality, that was macrophage activation. So Liver damage is not a big one in the context of most of the organs affected with COVID-19. And it's important to try and understand then why would it be relevant in the context of the vaccine? Now, when they say that it's rare, my question is actually, why does it occur? Because I did a quick check before, and I'm happy if, if other people can corroborate it, is that I just checked through um, on Google Scholar looking for the association with vaccination and liver injury. And outside of hepatitis and hepatitis B vaccines, it doesn't seem to be a major issue. Why would this be relevant in the context of COVID vaccines? Really important question. And this is why I said, when I look through the paradigm of autoimmunity, everything starts to make sense. So here are some of the examples of cases that they um, they had. And you can see here, this may be a little bit small, but the essence of it here is that this was one case, someone who was white. They did have a background of liver disease before and a liver transplant. And they had their event or the time to presentation was only two days. And they had presented with a number of other symptoms. So it's interesting to look at the patterns. And again, this cohort here had, again, background of liver disease. So it seems as though there can be an exacerbation of underlying liver disease. And this is why I said that that combination with regards to the fatty liver and alcohol, I think is extremely important. Uh, going back to the paper here, they highlighted again uh, in this case, it was 44 days to uh, presentation. The person was only 58. And again, they had previous liver disease, so autoimmune cirrhosis. The other person here had cirrhosis. This person only had psychological problems. It was about eight days to the presentation before they started to have abdominal pain and jaundice and so on. So if they had no background uh, liver disease, that in itself is an important question as to why would it occur. I'm just giving you another few examples here uh, from the paper. Um, this here is a 53-year-old male. It took 10 days to the presentation, and this person had no medical history. And they again presented with abdominal pain, lots of... Um, uh, these rep represent 
immune responses, hypersensitivity responses, myalgia, fatigue, jaundice. Um, and so they knew that this was an, probably an autoimmune case with fulminant liver failure. So that was quite significant. And so you can see the pattern here. This one, no medical history. Again, no medical history. This one was with the uh, AstraZeneca. This one here was Pfizer. This was Pfizer. Another one was Moderna. So the point is, is that it is not so much about the type of vaccine, but it seems to be related to the spike protein because it didn't, it was, it wasn't read, it wasn't connected with regards to the, the other bits. So a really, really important pattern. Now I've gone jumped down to the discussion and I've just got a few points here to make from the paper. And um, I've got it highlighted here. And the first thing that they said, so this is a discussion and they are talking about the considerable range of liver diseases that were observed following COVID-19 vaccination. I agree. It is really strange. Why would you have such a range of liver diseases? So it's not just autoimmune um, hepatitis and so on. Um, actually, before I do that, I just want to show you a, a, an important thing here. And this is what they are making reference to. So after I showed you all of the, um, the cases, this now is in reference to the conditions. So other than hepatitis, they also had portal vein thrombosis. Um, this is all the, the cases. And they had liver enzyme abnormalities in some. Um, they had acute liver injury in others. They had uh, autoimmune hepatitis. They had acute cellular rejection of liver transplants. It was splantric vein thrombosis. It was a whole range of things. Jaundice, hepatomegaly, um, uh, hepatic porphyria, acute uh, hepatic failure. So there was a whole range of liver responses that really is not typical. That's the bit that I, I'm saying here. These are not typical responses. So let me um, highlight again the bit about the discussion. So in the discussion here, as they said, a considerable range of liver diseases were observed following COVID-19 vaccination. And so they identified that autoimmune hepatitis, AIH, was defined as a chronic inflammatory disease of the liver characterized by circulating autoantibodies. As I mentioned before, if you don't understand autoimmunity around COVID and the, potentially the COVID vaccine, nothing makes sense. But again, they identified that loss of tolerance against the patient's own liver antigens is regarded as the main underlying pathogenic mechanism. Again, that's autoimmunity. And as they said further on, although the mechanisms associated with COVID-19 vaccination and autoimmune hepatitis are still unknown, molecular mimicry, that's where the proteins uh, that are triggered trigger the immune system, are similar to proteins, normal proteins in the body, has emerged as the most likely process associated with this phenomenon. And they noted, indeed, antibodies against the spike protein of S1 of SARS-CoV-2 had a high affinity against some human tissue proteins. This is known, and this is the point that I'm making to people, is that whenever you speak about adverse events and you're focused on issues, if you don't understand that time frame is extremely important in the context of autoimmunity, you will miss a whole range of problems. And I think this is what has happened. This is why excess mortality probably is up because they haven't connected the autoimmunity issue and therefore nothing seems to quite make sense. When I look at the liver, and I'm looking at it from my angle. And one important thing to say is that in the process of objectively pulling back from it, I have one heck of an insight about the fatty liver, the cause, the mechanism, really important, tied to insulin resistance. That will be shared in the webinar. So if you are interested, please come and join. So these are very important points. And I think that it's only the beginning of us trying to make sense of what is happening. My advice to people is very simple. Observe carefully your tolerance because you may find, say, people who are drinking alcohol, you may find that your tolerance for alcohol has changed. If you have noticed that, please don't ignore it. 
Meaning if you are used to drinking six pints on a weekend and you find that by the fourth pint, you really are feeling the effects of it, please don't continue to assume that you can still tolerate this level of intake. The same applies with drug use and almost everything else that your liver has to detoxify and manage. Without that kind of information out there for people, they will assume that everything is exactly as it was before. I think that's very dangerous and it could cause long-term serious liver disease and it takes a while for it to appear. And once it has occurred, there is very little that can be done other than liver transplantation. So I hope that you find this valuable. And again, join me on the webinar if you're interested. Donations large and small are appreciated. Any support and interest would be um, appreciated um, with the webinar. Have a great evening. Until the next time.